Good morning. One week after Easter, who had a ton of fun last week for Easter, right? Man, it, I can just tell everybody, it just felt like Christmas. We just had Christmas, and all of a sudden it's Easter already. You feel like me? Looks like things are a little bit more fast forward. I'm so grateful you guys are here today. We're going to turn right to Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 4. Grab your Bibles. I'm going to start us off in Genesis 46. Two, three, four, as we set the stage for our new message, Courageous Calling. While you're turning there, I hope you came in the building this morning with an expectation to hear from, to meet with, get ready for this, with the almighty God of the universe, your Father God. Look, if you've not Come in this building expecting to hear from your Father God this morning. Let me just let me just stop for one second and let's pray. Because that's what we're here for. That's what we're here for, to come in and give Him worship, first of all. That's what that was for, right? This music is to say, God, we love you. And number two, Father, I'm here for you, so pray with me. Father, we love you so much. I thank you that your presence is in this room with us, you say, where two or more are gathered, there you are. Father, we come to you, we lay before you expectant to hear from your word. Father, I thank you that we have your word. that you are wanting to meet with your sons and daughters. Father, I ask that we hear you clearly today. That whatever we brought in here, that we set that down at your feet. And we just say, oh, my heart is open for you. My mind is open to you. My ears are open to hear whatever it is that you have for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Forgive me for that. We had a little mic change out during the prayer. I know, that was a first for me. So Genesis 46, 2 through 4. Let me read that right out of the gate for us. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night. And he said, Jacob, Jacob. He said, here I am. Then he said, I am God, God of your father, God, your father, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. The same promise he gave to Abraham, right? Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, and then we'll, the main part of our passage today, Moses, I am your God, and I will make you a great nation. I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also bring you up again. And Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. We are talking about being courageous in our Father God. We actually started this message on Easter Sunday. I just didn't tell you that. Like we were talking about being courageous, that God chooses imperfect people to do his will, does he not? Aside from his son, he says, I'm going to use you. Right? He spoke to the Israelites and said, you are my people, I'm going to make, when he spoke to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. He promised him several things. There were four promises he made to Abraham. Land, numerous descendants, a blessing for him and his descendants, and this, this last part, a blessing through him for descendants. And you might turn on TV on ministry and hear these, hear these blessings all the time. And, they, and television ministry likes to tell you about the blessings. And, of course, it's attached to other stuff. And so we're not going to do that today. What I'm going to remind you, though, is you are God's people. We are God's people. You are God's son and daughter. They come from a long line of descendants of his family that he made promises to and we're going to read them today in his word and while he made promises let me see if this rings true for you while he made promises 
to bless you, to protect you, to work through you. Even Jesus said, I've got to go so the Holy Spirit can come and work through who? Through you. Through you. So God and even Christ himself made these promises to us. And then he promised this. And I promise you it's going to be super easy all the time. Right? No. We're going to read that in Exodus this morning. That even with God's promises, he allows us to walk through some serious trials and face many things to show us. And we'll talk about that. As sons and daughters of the one and only true God, we have been given an assignment. So this is what this whole message, this whole series is about. You, whether you believe it or not yet, you have been given an assignment. Every man and woman in this room has been given a work to do, no matter your season, no matter if you're 10 years old or 100 years old. By the way, Moses was way older than 100. You know that, right? No, I forget how old was Moses when he died. He didn't live quite to 180 like some of the other dudes did. God has given you an assignment. He says, I want to use you, and I promise you, if you'll lift your heads up and watch what I'm doing and trust my promises, we have been called, raised to, listen to these words, servant leadership. Servant leadership, meaning just like Christ, we have come to serve, right? Not to be served. We have come to serve. In Jesus' name, servant leaders, ministers of the gospel, we are commanded to go in his name. Is this not the courageous calling that every, I don't know about you, but this is in me. Like, I can't turn the volume down. Isn't this a calling that just confirms deeply in your spirit and your soul to say, this is what I was made for. I was made to Take Christ to others so that their lives would change. I was made to walk in the word and to watch the word and the spirit transform others. Like we were made to do this. Do you believe it yet? Man. That's from your father, God. His will, his work, his way. God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the church. Let me say this, and I hope I don't offend you this morning, or maybe I I should. Maybe I hope I offend you a little bit this morning. God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the church do not belong in a neat little box. It doesn't. Man. So many denominations and churches get this wrong. It's about men trying to control what the Holy Spirit is doing. And it's like the word doesn't say anything about that. It says, take my word, be obedient to it. Take Christ to the nations, take them into your community. Go therefore and make disciples right. Man. And like we've, I've watched the last 12 months here, I've watched what, and forgive me for saying it, I've watched what happens when you try to put God in a neat little box and say everything we're doing is going to be about paying off this building. That's not what we're here for. And forgive me for saying it, but it's not what we're here for. Do you guys agree with that? We are here to encourage one another in Christ He's going to take care of the rest of it. Like he's going to guide us. I come in all fired up about this because I spent a week with, a, with potentially a new partner. And we're going to pray through it as a church. You guys have heard of Samaritan's Purse and Operation Christmas Child, right? A lot of their leaders have transitioned to an organization that's taking actual clean water and safe water all over the world to nine different countries and... Listen to this. They're taking the living water of Jesus Christ through teaching and discipleship through the word. And man, I like I went there and I saw a warehouse full of volunteers building volunteers, unpaid people for Jesus, 
building these water systems that were being shipped, no cost, by FedEx all over the world. I was, I was blown away by what God was doing there. And I said, guys, what are all these trainings about that you're doing around these systems? And they smiled. I said, why are there so many trainings around these clean water systems? And, I, and, and they smiled. And they said, that's where we are not only training them about what clean water is and sanitation is, we're training them about who Jesus is and who God the Father is and what the scripture says. Be praying, I'm fired up. I am fired up and I've already kind of reached out to our leadership team to talk about it. Be praying for it. God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit and the church do not belong in a neat little box. Matter of fact, I think this is why many men have left the church over the last 50 years. And it is like the church is trying to figure out again, like, how, why did we lose our men? Like some other countries that have, have, have gone astray for many years. You lose the man, you lose the family. Statistics show if you, if you reach a kid with the gospel, that's amazing. That's fantastic. But the percentage, the likelihood of that child and that whole family staying in their faith walk is like 26%. If you reach the woman first and then the family, the likelihood of that family staying in their walk with Christ over a lifetime and not straying from it is like 30, 30%. Statistics show when you reach the man the leader, the spiritual leader of the family, the statistical likelihood of that man and his wife and the kids, their entire household, not only living it out for the rest of their lives, but generation after generation after generation is 98%. There's a reason why we go after men. It's because going after the man, you get the man, the wife, and the family. Praise God. The church has been making this neat little box for God to for, for fit into for so many years to the point where we've lost grip and vision and a courageous calling on our life that it is, right? Have you seen it? Have you felt it? It's time. It's time to again, and we've already started this. Before too long, you will get invited into one of the discipleship groups. It's a very small wave that started with our men. Our women are about to kick it off next. You will be invited into one of our discipleship groups. We are going to take the box and throw it away and say the only thing we need is Jesus and God's word and one another. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm done preaching. Let me, let me get to God's word. Last week, we ended with Jesus said go to some very imperfect disciples. Peter, if you're headstrong and rash and make just decisions like the seat of your pants, you're, you're in good company. Peter was like you. You were like Peter. Peter and his brother Andrew were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee and were the first two disciples to follow Jesus. After Pentecost, Peter became the leader of of the apostles that launched the church together. That's Peter. So if your head's strong and you're black and white, let's get you into this word and let's point you to where God wants his next church, okay? I want to talk to you. Maybe you were made to be a leader in the church. John, sometimes John wished that, that God, he asked Jesus, why don't we just call fire from heaven down to wipe these people out? And Jesus says, oh, John. Then John went to Ephesus. Later on, he was exiled to Patmos. John wrote four books of the Bible. One of them happens to be a very important book that I love since my teenage years, the Revelation. John, one of Christ's disciples, the one who wanted to bring fire down from heaven to finish the work that God said he was going to do, God like actually opened up heaven and let him see it and said, here's what's coming. And Jesus is going to bring it. All right. Today we're talking about Moses. 
Today we're talking about Moses, Exodus 2, 11 through 15. Turn with me there. Moses, you know, the. if you don't know the story of Moses, you got to go back and read all of Exodus. Moses was a Hebrew. He was born during a time where, where the Israelites were being persecuted. They were slaves. And because of a prophecy that one day a Hebrew would lead a great nation of people, against Egypt, the Pharaoh of Egypt calls for all of the, of the children to be killed, the Hebrew children. Moses was protected by that. He actually was put into a river, into a basket, and floated into the Egyptian family where he was cared for as one of their own, believe it or not. Moses grows up as an Egyptian. And as he is in his young adult years, his mid-age years, he starts to see and have this heart for his people, slaves. He doesn't even know that they're his people. They're being beaten and punished and persecuted. And then he comes up on one that's being almost to the point of death, beaten to death. And Moses steps in and says, stop. This man raised by Egyptians, weren't even his own family, was standing up for the slaves being beaten and persecuted. And then he had to flee for his life. Read through Exodus 1, get to Exodus 2. We're going to get up to the point of Exodus 2.11. Or you could watch the Hollywood version movie called Exodus, which gets most, some of it right. Enough for you to get the feeling of Holy cow, this is amazing. I watched it yesterday, by the way. Loved it. So let's start. When Moses fled, he, fled, he flees to Midian, and this is Exodus 2, 11 through 15. Read with me here. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian. This is talking about the beating again before he fled. The beating of a Hebrew of one of his people, he looked this way and that. He was looking around to see and to see no one. And he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely this thing is known. He, he's been discovered for what he's done. When the Pharaoh had heard of it, he'd sought to kill Moses. The Pharaoh was going to end Moses' life for killing one of the Egyptians. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. He sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them and watched their flock. And when they came home to the father, rule, he said, how is it that you have come home so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. An Egyptian came and delivered us. It was almost as if God was foreshadowing what was to come. Jump with me to Exodus 2 and we'll read 23 through 25. During those many days of the king, Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Now Moses was keeping flock of his father-in-law. He's out in the desert. It's night likely. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, and and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness. And he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the same place that is later called the Mount Sinai. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of a fire in the midst of the bush. Go back to the, the burning bush picture for a moment. 
Guys, I was like trying to find pictures and imagery that would make this story come to life. Like who I would have loved to have been there in that moment for the first time. This is Moses, a man who fled for his life from Egypt. He's hiding in the desert. He's, he found a new family. Praise God for that. But think about this for a second. He is still thinking about the people that are being enslaved and beaten and persecuted back where he came from. He's still carrying this. This is who am I, right? I grew up in this Egyptian like palace, this life of of like not wanting for anything as a prince. And here I am living in the desert, like not knowing which way to go, what to do. And God meets him like this in a burning bush, but the bush was not. It was burning, yet it was not consumed. Verse three, and Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside the sea, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry. Because of their taskmasters, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing of milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivivites, and Jebusites. Je Jebusites, forgive me for that last one. Lots of Zs. God says, I've heard my people cry and the sufferings. Go back to the land of Egypt with the pyramid again. God's people, the Israelites, are in this land that is being built up on their backs, right? And to the point of death and wearisome and God we can't take anymore they have been praying and crying out to God for hundreds of years saying God like we need you God where are you and it took one of God's people who didn't even know he was God's person to finally like have this conviction in his spirit when Moses stood watching the people being persecuted. It took one to stand there and go, enough, right? Like in your life, I, let me just talk to you for a minute. In your life, in my life, like have we not been convicted to the point where we are willing to draw a line in the sand like Christ did and say, enough of this craziness, right? Where are all the godly men, right? I'm thankful for you, those of you who were dedicated to show up in this church, dedicated. We had several men actually in Wynn, Arkansas, helping pull limbs and trees and cut like, and help the victims there. We actually have like groups of people after Wynn will go, we'll finally get to Mississippi, which is what we were preparing for all along. Man, if you're wondering why you're here hearing this message, maybe it's this. Think about the men and women that you come in contact during the week, every day of the week. Maybe it's our job. Maybe it's your job to finally say, maybe I'm the Moses that's supposed to stand in front of them and say, are you ready to actually do something huge in your life? Are you ready to make a difference in your life, and no, I'm not talking about more zeros in your bank account, right? 
No, I'm not talking about another like vacation down to the Bahamas. Has that fulfilled you yet? Even though it sounds kind of fun, I have to admit. No, I'm not talking about more comforts for your family so that they can enjoy their life a little bit more. I'm talking about me and you standing up, making a difference for God and other people's lives. Like we're, wait, we're waiting for God to stand in front of us in, with a, in a burning bush to say, I can use you. Are you ready? And here's what, guys, he already did that. He made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, now to Moses to say, I'm going to do great things. I'm going to bless my people. I just need you to be about my business. Let's lock arms together and go do this. Amen. Let's come to church weekly and say, Father, we love you through worship. Father, you can have all of me through worship in the word. Let the word remind you and convict you. It's not meant to, it's meant to convict you in a good way, right? Who's convicted a little bit sometimes when they hear the word? It's meant to convict you in a good way. If you really read what Christ did through in the gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, when, when people describe Jesus, like you talk about he's love and he's love and he is, but he is a perfect and holy God that says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And then he said things like this, come follow me. I will make you fishers of men. That's what he said. He said things like, I must go to the father so that you can go. Do the work God has called you to do, right? And then when, when we ask, Father, can I sit at your right side or can I sit at your left side because I want to be great like you, Jesus said things like, my goodness, I came to serve, right? Not to be served and to give his life for so many. Here's the question, are you and I if God was standing in front of us in a burning bush moment, and he does, we'll talk about that in a second. Are you and I really ready to sacrificially say, here I am, have all of me. Here I am, have all of me. Because that's what it takes to live this courageous life of faith. Willing to lay your life down for everyone else, time after time after time again. Husbands, you know why it's hard? Hard to be a dad and a father and a husband? Because it's not about us anymore. It's not. It's about them. Right? When you get home from work, it's time to turn on the video games, isn't it? To have a little me time, right? Play some pool? No. It's time to love your wife. It's time to love those kids. It's time to wrap your arms around them and pray for them and encourage them and tell them, you are an amazing gift and I love you. The, how I do it in my house is we try to wash the dishes, right? And Myra goes, why are those my dishes, right? Why aren't they all of our dishes? And that, that's our job to prove to her those aren't her dishes. Those are all of our dishes. Yesterday, she gave me a new item on the list. She said, you can start washing towels. And I heard it. I heard you, honey. I heard you, okay? Because I was looking for a towel around the house. She goes, well, you know where they are. They're in the dirty clothes, and you can put a load in. This is our job. It, scripture says live with your wife in an understanding way, does it not? Here's the point. I know I'm being a little funny and silly, but men... You gave up the right to just do whatever you want to do and have fun in this life and all of that stuff. When you said, I love you, I'm in, God, you have me, use me to pour myself out on others. We're supposed to go to bed exhausted, man. That's our job. Exhausted. That's what scripture says. Ask, come ask me. I'll show you where it is. It's right in Genesis when they messed up. And then God says, you're going to toil for the rest of your life for work. So 
right? Let's have a debate about that. You're supposed to go to bed exhausted because you're loving and serving through God so much. You're loving and serving your wife and your kids. You're giving them everything. Then you're going and investing and pouring your life out into disciples, right? And then you're doing the same thing through your church. And when your head hits the pillow at night, your eyelids are praising God because they're finally shutting. And you will have a really good night of sleep. And you'll wake up the next day encouraged and energized. Our life is not about the work that we do and making the money that we make. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Because if you do that well, that's a gift of generosity, okay? But I'm just saying, are we really living as if we've had a burning bush moment with God? Are we really in his word to the point where it's so convicting, yet so exciting, and it's like, oh my gosh, use me that way. Use me that way, Father. And, and hear me on this. I'm not always level 10 energized, okay? And sometimes I'm level 10 energized the opposite way, right? Where my brothers have to say, Larry, that's not it. So I'm not saying I'm perfect. They're saying that's not it. This is it. How we stay there, and this is a promise. If you don't have this, then you cannot live in this moment. You cannot live with a courageous calling unless you have two other dudes around you or ladies, two other ladies around you saying, you are gods. You can do this. That is the only way to live like a Moses. He had a Joshua. He had, right? He had his father-in-law to say, you are gods. You can do this. I believe in you. Let me keep going. And I'll get to the finish line because it says we have three minutes left. And I've been preaching for like a, quite a long time. I'm going to pick back up, read the rest of the story. In verse 9. And now behold, the cry of people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression, this is God, with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children, out of Israel, out of Egypt. I'm going to get to the now what. So I'll finish the rest of this. Then we'll have a moment of prayer. But Moses said to God in verse 11, who am I? Who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Man, and I'll, let me just say this. Which one of us has not said that? Who am I? Let today be the last day you ever say that. You are God's child. You are a son and a daughter of the most high God. And let me just promise you this. I promise you anything you do from this day forward in his name, out of obedience to the scripture, out of taking Jesus to those who need it, don't make it about anything else. It's about taking Christ now to others. Take Christ. That's who you are. You're his messenger. Take Christ to those who've never heard. Take Christ into this community for people that are lacking and smile. Who you are is someone who says, yes, God, you can have all of me. Like Moses, we often say, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt he said but I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt you shall serve God on this mountain that mountain's name is Mount Sinai 
Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he says, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. I am. Sent Moses. I am is still in the business of sending. And guys, I am so thankful for you. I am so thankful for this courageous call that God placed on our life. And if, you, and if you're still sitting here today going, I'm ready. Like, I'm ready. Pastor Larry, but I don't know what my next step is. Like, I don't know what to do right after this encounter with God. We're going to have a few of our ministry leaders hanging out in the back in the prayer area. I'll be back there too. Let us pray with you. Let us pray with you. Spend some time with a few of the leaders and the godly men and women in our church that lead small groups, that lead our ministry teams. And just say, hey, I want to join in. I want to be a part of what God's already doing. Stand with me and we'll pray for a moment. Let's pray. Father God, we are only here for you. Father, I got to see it afresh again this week, what it means to take Christ to the nations. to be about reaching the last, the lost, and the least. And yes, we are doing that right here. I just ask that you speak loudly to us. And even your scripture says in a still, soft voice, your spirit speaks to show us the men and women right here that we can share Christ with in word and in deed. Father, thank you for this courageous call in our life that we should not be comfortable. Thank you for this courageous call in our life that you have called us to live sacrificially, to serve in the way that you've gifted us to, in the way that Christ did. Father, for those that have not made the decision to follow you, I ask that you make it so clear this morning that you are calling them to lay down their life, to ask for forgiveness that only Jesus' death on the cross could cover, but it does. And let us all rise in new life because of your son. That is the only way we can be the courageous men and women you've called us to be. Because of your son, Christ. We love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.